Okay, so as I said, more of this Craig substitution. Um, yesterday we did a sign substitution. So you might think today it's going to be the cosine and the tangent. <laughs> Actually, it's the secant and the tangent. I've said a few times now that in some, <laughs> yeah, sorry, that in some applications, the secant is more important than the cosine in the calculus. So remember that these trig substitutions are basically a pattern recognition. Last time it was the square root of a squared minus squared. And it was, if you see this, you might try letting x be a sine theta. Here, um, I mean, the difference between this and what we did yesterday is the order that we're subtracting in. And if you see this, you might try letting x be a times the secant of theta. And again, I mean, I've said this before because it never stops being true. There's no one size fits all rule that lets us take every integral. This is just a suggestion. It might work, it might not work. There might be other things we should be trying instead. And if X is that, you don't need to memorize DX because DX is just the derivative of X, but make sure to remember that you have to change the DX. So the derivative of the secant is the secant times the tangent. Um, and the picture, you should have a picture in your mind. Remember yesterday when we needed like the cosine of theta or something, and we ended up getting it using right triangle trigonometry. So this time the base is constant, the hypotenuse can change. And the square root is the opposite side. <laughs> and just like, um, just like yesterday, we're going to be using the Pythagorean identity. Um, any time, we use trig substitution. It's with the goal <laughs> of getting rid of a square root. <laughs> oh. Sorry. Um, it's with the goal of getting a square under a square root, and then the square and the square root canceling. So we'll always be using the Pythagorean identity, but there are variations of this identity. And I don't know that you need to memorize these variations, but um, you should be familiar with them. In particular, notice that there's no secant or tangent 
facts in the Pythagorean identity. Um, but if we take both sides of this, and divided both sides by the sine squared. What would happen? Um, well, if we have addition in the top of the fraction, then we can break that fraction into two. That is to say, this can be written as the sine squared over the sine squared plus the cosine squared over the sine squared. The sine squared divided by the sine squared is just one. The cosine squared over the sine squared is the cotangent squared. And one over the sine <laughs> square is, let me think, the cosecant square. Um, we got that by dividing by the sine. If we divided both sides by the cosine, the sine over the cosine is the tangent. The cosine over the cosine is one. One divided by the cosine is the secant squared. And I mean, the reason I'm telling you this now is we're going to introduce a secant into this problem. We're going to introduce multiple secants. And introducing the secant in this way is going to give us secants under the square root. And we'll rewrite the secant under the square root as the tangent squared. So when it comes time to use the Pythagorean identity, instead of the sine squared plus the cosine squared equaling one, we'll need <laughs> that third equality. <laughs> So I guess all that really remains is to see if we can make this work. Let's try to integrate one divided by x squared times the square root of x squared minus four. We're uh, making our life easier here. What if instead of x squared minus four, we had x squared minus five? Well, that wouldn't change anything fundamental, except that notice the square root that's causing us to consider this trig substitution <laughs> as that expression, x squared minus a squared. Well, x squared minus five, 
five is the square root of five squared. So the fact that we didn't have a perfect square doesn't fundamentally change anything. It's just that we'll have that square root of five hanging out in our problem. So what on earth is this? Go away. Go, um, sorry, fighting with this computer. Do not want one drive. There we go. So I'm not cheating by making this x squared minus four. It would work if it were a non-perfect square. I'm just making my life slightly easier. <laughs> So um, the important thing is that we have the square root of x squared minus a positive number, x squared minus four. And any positive number can be written as a square, just like that. And this is the pattern, this square root is the pattern that we suggested we should look for as far as using this trig substitution, as far as letting x be a times the c. So the let me not forget that dx it's uh, it's quite important if you forget the dx when you're writing the integral there's a chance that you'll forget the dx when you're doing the substitution, and that would be quite important. You need to uh, do the x's and the dx's. And all that remains is to plug stuff in and see if we can make this work. Um, again, there's no uh, guarantees in calculus. Maybe we'll turn everything into theta and our new integral will be so ugly that we can't take it. And then it's back to the drawing board. But let's try this. Does anybody have any questions before we do? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm sorry this uh, section is so lecture focused. It's just that these problems are so long. If I paused class to have you do one, it would probably take half the class. So, it's um it's a little awkward to do anything like that. And the picture that we have here, let's throw this up as well. There's X, there's two, and there's this square root. And our integral is one divided by x squared. And we're letting x be 
two times the secant theta. So two times the secant theta squared. The square root of two times the secant theta squared minus four. And then dx is two times the secant of theta times the tangent of theta d theta. So when you uh, do trigonometric substitution, you always <laughs> You always get this awful mess, and then you have to try to simplify stuff and hope stuff simplifies. Um, so in the denominator, Two times the secant squared is four times the secant squared. The square root is always going to be dealt with in basically the same way. Um, this is what we did yesterday too. If we square this, We'll get four times the secant squared minus four. And what we always do is we take the constant in, um, in this case, the constant is four. And we pop that constant out. And if we pull a four out, we get the secant squared minus one. And now we have two times the secant times the tangent. Let me just for space reasons, <laughs> two times the secant times the tangent. <laughs> Let me pop that up there. And we can keep the d theta there. And now um, trigonometric substitution, it might end up being ugly. It might be so ugly that it just doesn't work. But it will always, if you see a square root and you do the trigonometric substitution associated with the square root, the trigonometric substitution will always get rid of the square root for you. So whatever its other flaws, the trigonometric substitution, definitely is going to get rid of this square root. Um, but we can pop a four out. The square root of four is two. So we have another two under the denominator. I don't want to copy this all out again just for that. But the square root of four is two. And if we have another two in the bottom of the fraction, that four times two is eight. And now, as promised, we're going to get rid of the square root. And we always get rid of the square root in the same basic way. It's always 
the Pythagorean identity or one of the variations of the Pythagorean identity. In this case, we have a secant squared minus one. We erase all of the stuff that we're not going to be using for this problem. And I guess we can defy convention by working up instead of down. If we subtract one from both sides of this equality, the tangent squared is the secant squared minus one. So you can see what's going to happen. We have that secant squared minus one sitting inside a square root. And this secant squared minus one is going to be the tangent squared. And the square root of a square, the square and the square root are going to cancel and we're going to be left with the tangent. And uh, as appalling as this problem is, we're actually coming close to an end here. Maybe I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't call problems I'm doing appalling, but I don't think there is any denying that, that this trig substitution can be pretty tedious. Um, eight times the secant squared, times the square root of the tangent square. And I actually have something to say about the square root of the tangent squared, but for now, I'm just going to simplify it in the natural way. The square root and the square will cancel. I'm uh, not at the moment doing anything with the top. But I'll simplify the bottom like that. And um, now what? Well, well, uh, now we can hopefully simplify. I mean, as I've said, it's perfectly possible that we go through all of the work of the trigonometric substitution and we get some new integral and we stare at it for a bit and then we say, well, I don't know how to integrate this either. But um, that's not as you might expect, given that I picked this problem out that's not going to happen here. These tangents are going to cancel. And this secant up top is going to cancel one of the secants down below. And we get... <laughs> 
2 over 8, and we get 1 over the secant. And it would actually be very easy to, uh, to sort of trick back the very finish line and think, so well, I don't know how to integrate one over the secant. So I don't know what to do, but um, remember what the secant is. The secant is one over the cosine. So one over one over the cosine is the cosine. And we certainly know how to integrate the cosine. The integral of the cosine is the sine. <laughs> Two eighths times the sine of theta plus c. Not done yet. Um, very close to being done. The end is in sight. Uh, but what the heck is theta? Theta isn't our variable. Theta is just this dummy variable that we introduced to kickstart this uh, substitution process. So we certainly don't want the sign of theta in our answer. And usually we're going to use a bit of right triangle trigonometry at the end of these problems. Because what's the sign of theta? Well, if we have a right triangle, the, the sine of theta is the opposite side over the hypotenuse. This is why it's so important um, I think our textbook tells you what the substitutions are, but I don't think our textbook, maybe it does, but I don't think our textbook shows the pictures. And that's, that's an oversight. You need to have these pictures in the back of your mind um, so that you can use right triangle trigonometry. So the sine of theta is the opposite over the hypotenuse, the square root of x squared minus four. And the hypotenuse is x. And two eighths is um, one four. Let's simplify that a little. Uh, questions. I know these problems. <laughs> I know these problems are very. Uh, lengthy, 
I mean, once you do the substitution, it becomes a matter of being very careful with your algebra more than anything else. Um, So I don't think this is going to come up in the homework, which by the way, homework probably going up uh, tomorrow, Wednesday. I haven't forgotten about it. But the trig substitution that we just did actually reacts really awkward with the fundamental theorem of calculus. Like, if you go to Wolfram Alpha or Mathematica or whatever, and you, um, you ask it to compute the indefinite integral that we just computed, it will give us the answer we got. And you know, say that we want the integral from, let's see, x is stuck between negative two and two here. Maybe we want the integral from one to two of this, um, thing that we just integrated. Well, I mean, the fundamental theorem works in the ordinary way. We find, um, <laughs> we find the antiderivative. We stick in one, we stick in two. X squared minus one. One and two don't make any sense here. I mean, one, would give you the square root of negative three. So if we had like two and four, that makes sense now. And we just stick these numbers in, in the ordinary way, stick the four in, 16 minus four is 12. Stick the two in, you stick two in here, you get zero and you get an answer in the ordinary way. Um, the second, Substitution How should I put this? Um, is a little different. If both the limits of integration are negative. 
And I don't think this is going to show up like in the homework or quizzes or tests, but it's something that it's good to at least mention. Um, in particular, let me find it here. So let me unscribble out everything. So going from here to here, we said that the square root of the tangent squared is the tangent. And that isn't quite true. The square root of the tangent squared is the absolute value of the tangent. Like, I mean, they, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing special about the tangent. This is just always true. The square root of negative five squared is not negative five. It's the absolute value of negative five. So um, if your limits of integration are both positive. So like if your limits of integration are two and four, it turns out that the tangent is also positive and the absolute value doesn't do anything. If your limits of integration are negative, Then the tangent, let me, where are? Then the tangent is negative. And instead of turning into one, the tangent over the tangent disappeared, and we just had one over the secant. we wind up with a negative sign that then persists throughout the problem. This is the only time that anything like this is going to happen. Um, the substitution we did yesterday, this never happens with that. The square root and the square just cancel out when we do that substitution. It's only in the very specific situation where you're doing the secant substitution and you've got a definite integral. So you're looking at limits of integration and the limits of integration are both negative. But in that very specific situation, you have to remember that the square root of a square is really an absolute value. So there's one, and, and it's good. I mean, as I say, it is good to remember this because like Technology like Wolfram Alpha, even though it's really powerful, it does sometimes just ignore complications like that. Like if you tell Wolfram Alpha, 
Find me this indefinite integral. Well, Fram Alpha is just not going to put in a negative sign. It's going to assume that everything is positive. And if you then use that answer to try to take um, definite integrals, you'll get mistakes and you'll have no idea what's gone wrong. So even in these days of technology, that is a good thing to know. Um, well, 40 minutes to do one example, but I don't want to spend tomorrow doing uh, trig substitution as well. I think this has worn out its welcome. So I'll just put the third substitution on the board. If you see yeah, a square root that looks like this, then you might try letting x be a times the tangent of beta. And dx then will be the secant squared theta. So what's different in between this equation and the last one that we just used? Um, the last one had subtraction. Okay. The last one was x squared minus a squared. <laughs> Um, and you end up, so you end up with the tangent squared plus one under the square root. So you'll once again end up using this variation of the Pythagorean identity. And the, uh, the picture we have here, Here's theta, here's x, here's a, here's the square root of a squared plus x squared. And that's trigonometric substitution. It's a very in some ways, it's a very specialized technique. It comes up in sort of geometric problems where you have right angles and these things are growing or shrinking and you're interested in rates of chain. Um, but specialized or not, it, it's, as I said but yesterday, it's part of the standard curriculum. It's good to at least see it. Uh, tomorrow, we'll, as I say, we'll just be done with this section. Uh, we might actually finish up integration techniques this week. And, um, then move on to other things. But in any event, um, I'll see you tomorrow. Hopefully, a little less coughing by then. Uh, be healthy out there. Clearly, something is going around campus.